Hi everyone! Tonight's video is on species concepts, and in this video I'm going to discuss the questions what is a species and how did the different species of these organisms arise? So the first thing we want to look at is the Linnaean classification system. We briefly looked at this at the beginning of the year. A domain is the largest group in the Linnaean classification system of life. It has the broadest definition. The species is the smallest category. It has the most specific definition. It has the smallest definition. And this classification system, it's hierarchical. All the qualities of a subcategory are present in the category above it. But what defines a species, our smallest category? Turns out there's a lot of different definitions. So we're going to go through four different definitions of species. The first one that I want to talk about is the biological species concept. The biological species concept states that if two organisms can mate and produce fertile offspring, they are in the same species. So we see here this adorable family of dogs who have produced a puppy. So these two dogs could mate and produce a fertile offspring Therefore, by the biological species concept, they are in the same species. So when do we use this definition? Any living organisms that we can observe and study, we use the biological species concept. It's always the best definition. We use it whenever we can. But what if you're studying fossils? Can you use the biological species concept to determine if these two fossils are in the same species? In this case, you can't because they're dead. <laughs> they can't mate. So we use what's called the morphological species concept. In the morphological species concept, two organisms would have similar morphology. Morphology means things like size and shape and general organization. When do we use this definition? We use them for bacteria. Bacteria don't mate. We also use this definition for dead organisms preferably ones that have an intact skeleton so that you have a lot of different bones to compare, but you could use it if you only had a few bones if they were very large, significant bones in the organism. What if you have access to an organism's DNA? Remember, DNA is, has four nucleotides. They're A, C, G, and T. And the genetic code is the order of these four nucleotides. What if you could compare the different orders of the nucleotides in different organisms. Scientists can actually sequence DNA in the lab really quickly, so this is something that scientists can do. And when they do this, they use what's called the DNA species concept. If the DNA sequences of two organisms are the same, or very, very close to the same, they're considered to be in the same species. When do we use this definition? We use it for bacteria. We also use it for dead organisms with intact DNA, but maybe not intact skeletons, so we can't use the morphological species concept. Now I wanna note that DNA does survive a really long time after death, but it doesn't survive forever. So no DNA dinosaur, no, I'm sorry, no dinosaur DNA has ever been isolated. What if you can't study the organism to see if it mates and produces live young? you can't obtain this DNA, and you don't have any bones to compare. Then you use what's called the ecological species concept. In that concept, you compare how organisms are adapted to a specific environment and how they use the resources. When do we use this definition? <laughs> when we have no other choice. If you have no other way to determine whether two organisms are in the same species, we use the ecological species concept as a last resort. Now, how did all these different species of organisms arise? If you look at all these different species here of rabbits, I love this one with the little floppy ears, how did all these different species of rabbits arise? Well, evolution of two species from one original species always involves isolation, either physical or genetic, from each other. We call this a restriction of gene flow. Do you remember when we covered microevolutionary processes and gene flow was one of them, where you had a member of one population joining another population? If you restrict that, 
you can get two different species evolving. There's two ways to isolate and restrict gene flow. One is called allopatric speciation, and this is where you have a geographic isolation. Something in the geography physically isolates two organisms from each other. The other is called sympatric speciation, where there is no geographic isolation. So I'm going to go through briefly each of these two forms of forming two different species from one species. The first is allopatric speciation, or geographic isolation. We're going to start with an ancestral population of rabbits, this white rabbit we see at the top of the picture. In this case, if two parts of the population get separated geographically, in this picture it's by a river, but it could be a canyon, it could be parts of a population get left on an island and then it gets flooded, so the other parts are on a different place separated by water. If it's a really small organism, it could be a large highway. A large highway could separate frogs or salamanders or snakes. Even a wall can separate members of, of, of a population if they're small. Once they're separated, the two populations on either side of whatever is separating them geographically are, separate, sep, are subject to different evolutionary pressures. They might have a different climate. They might have a slightly different terrain. They might have different predators. This is going to cause them to evolve differently. Once they've evolved diff phenotypic differences between each other, they start to become different species. Eventually, these differences will affect the ability to mate and reproduce, making them completely different species by what species concept? Which species concept is defined by the ability to mate and reproduce? That's right, the biological species concept. A classic example of this has happened in the Grand Canyon. On one side of the Grand Canyon, there are small squirrels, and on the other side of the Grand Canyon, there is another population of squirrels. These squirrels used to be in the same species, but when the Grand Cam Canyon e formed by the river eroding the rock, some parts of the population of squirrels got stuck on the north rim, and some got stuck on the south rim. And squirrels don't swim, so they couldn't cross the river. They eventually evolved into different species that can no longer interbreed. The second way that two species can form is called sympatric speciation, and that's where there's no geographic isolation. In this case, a new species forms within a population in the same location. This is common in plants, and it always involves mistakes a non-disjunction event in meiosis. And in this case, the non-disjunction would happen to every single chromosome in the genome. So if we start with a diploid plant, diploid plant would undergo meiosis and would normally produce haploid gametes. But in this case, if a non-disjunction event across the whole genome, it could produce diploid gametes. And if you recall, plants have both male and female parts, so they can produce male gametes and female gametes. And these gametes can self-fertilize. So if a diploid plant had a mistake in meiosis and produced diploid gametes, the diploid male gamete could fertilize the diploid female gamete, and that would produce a tetraploid plant. This tetraploid plant gametes would be diploid when it went through meiosis and they would not be able to be fertilized by haploid gametes that would be produced by the original diploid plant. That makes them different species. Interestingly, this is what has happened with strawberries. The strawberries that you buy in the store are octoploid. They've had this process of undergoing a mistake in meiosis twice so that they have an octopoid plant. Octopoid strawberries are huge. Look at the size of that strawberry. In contrast, here are diploid strawberries that are produced by wild strawberries. Farmers will actually breed and produce the, the octoploid strawberries because they produce such large fruit. So what you should know from tonight's video, you should know the different definitions of species and when they would be used. You should know the two ways that new species can arise. You should know what's the same about these two different ways species can arise and what's different about them. And you should know in what type of organisms do you see these different types of speciation. So that's all for tonight.